21-year-old woman has given evidence at the trial of two Ireland and Ulster rugby players. Paddy Jackson and Stuart Olding are accused of raping the student at Mr Jackson's home in Belfast in June 2016. Both men deny the charge. She was 19 at the time of the alleged incidents in June 2016. Recalling events, she told of going to a friend's house for drinks, then to this Belfast nightclub, and after it closed to the house of Ulster and Ireland rugby player Paddy Jackson. Also there were Stuart Olding, Blaine McElroy and Rory Harrison. Olding and Jackson had just returned from a rugby tour with the Irish squad in South Africa. We learnt uh, in court when Paddy took the stand that he was very close, he said, to Stuart Olding. They met at a rugby academy. Um, he said that he knew Blaine McElroy since he was about 11. Uh, they met in school and I think it was the same with Rory Harrison as well. So the four had known each other for a long time. She described being upstairs in a bedroom with Paddy Jackson and engaging in consensual kissing, initiated by him. And at that point, the two returned downstairs. A short time later, the woman decided she was going to leave the party. So she said she went upstairs to get her handbag and that Jackson followed her upstairs. She said Paddy Jackson removed some of her clothes and raped her. She said Stuart Olding came into the room and forced her to have sex with him. She said Blaine McElroy came into the room naked and at that point her fight instincts kicked in. She told him... How many times does it take for a girl to say no before it sinks in? She described how a fourth man, Rory Harrison, accompanied her home in a taxi. She said she obviously wasn't OK. All four defendants deny the charges. The next day she texted Harrison and this was probably the most important text of the entire trial. She told Harrison what happened last night was not consensual. She was also in touch with, with, with her friends uh, and she told one friend that she was raped. This young woman believed that she had been raped. She went to the police a day after uh, the events uh, took place um, that in her view constituted rape. Initially, she was not minded to make a report to the police because you think they're not going to believe you. She changed her mind and made a statement to the PSNI on June the 30th. Well, the, the players were arrested in June of 2016, not all long after the alleged incident, but it didn't come to light um, un until November of 2016. Uh, it took a, a number of months before the PPS and the police obviously uh, decided to, to charge the players. Uh, and then once um, it, it came to trial, then it, it came into the, the public domain in a really big way. When the news broke, you know, that there had been uh, an incident uh, involving two international rugby players. The chattering class has got to work. The trial opened on the 30th of January 2018 and the Six Nations kicked off on the 3rd of February 2018. So there was just days in the difference. So as the uh, complainant was taking the stand to give her evidence and as we were hearing about the, the text messages and the WhatsApp messages, we were also hearing um, about how the team were preparing for that first game in Paris. <laughs> so the timing was dreadful, dreadful from the RFU perspective. Today, the cross-examination of the 21-year-old complainant by Brendan Kelly, senior counsel for Paddy Jackson, began. He referred to the woman's contacts by phone, text and WhatsApp with three friends after the alleged assault on June the 28th. At the start of evidence, uh, a royal blue curtain was pulled over their witness stand. And this meant that she could only see the judge, the jury and the lawyers. But the rest of the courtroom could see her because a camera system was set up which transmitted her evidence to flat screen televisions around the court. Um, so for the entirety of her cross-examination, we had a full view of her, but she couldn't see us. One of the key differences between the law in the Republic and in the North is that um, in the North, the public is admitted uh, to the public gallery, who are then sort of, you know, quite casually, some of them using social media and the complainant's name was out there. And there was a certain stage that if you put in her name alongside those of the defendants, it would come up along with details and stuff. In this case, with the uh, identity of the defendants being um, widely known and the attendant publicity that that brought uh, on the case, and on them, and on everybody involved in the case, Judge Smith had a very, very difficult job to keep the case um, on track. 
in the public gallery you had people from all walks of life, uh, people from legal backgrounds, uh, people who had never attended a trial in their life but they had to come and see this pure for the, the entertainment factor. Rory Best, a captain of the Ireland uh, team, shows up one day to the court uh, to watch what was going on, you know, and this caused ructions online. He was playing in the first game at the Six Nations as captain a few days later. People felt that there was an inappropriate use of his time. There was blue murder over this, and a lot of people felt the Irish captain shouldn't be showing support for um, players on trial. That's kick-started kind of the protests in the middle of the, of the trial. We had the hashtag not my captain trending. Uh, at the next Ireland game, some fans actually held up a tricolour with the words, I believe her on it. The reason I was there is, obviously it's, it's on the record that I've been called as a character witness and I was advised that it was important that I got both sides of the story so that I could make an informed decision um, about that. And um, because it's an ongoing legal matter, um, I'll not make any further comment um, other than that. The relationship with, uh, between Rory Best and Paddy Jackson was very, very close. Um, he, Paddy Jackson said he had learnt a lot from Rory over the years. And I mean, to the point where he had even babysat for his six-year-old kid. Uh, they had, he had attended his birthday party. So this extended way beyond rugby. Earlier, Judge Patricia Smith said it may have been hard for the jurors not to be aware of press coverage about the attendance of Rory Best at the trial last week. She said the only reason the Ireland rugby captain was in the courtroom was because he was directed to be there by senior counsel. In the end, none of the very well-known character witnesses actually ended up giving evidence. A woman who has accused two Ireland and Ulster rugby players of rape has told defence lawyers at Belfast Crown Court that she was not attracted to celebrities. The woman's evidence to the prosecution lasted just one day. But next, of course, was the evidence to the defence, uh, who had an opportunity to cross-examine her. So, four defendants meant four cross-examinations. In the end, he was in the witness box for a total of eight days. I think that a lot of people felt, is that really an experience that many people would be willing to go through? It was incredibly graphic, I mean, really graphic at times. There were certain days you could hear a pin drop when they were going through certain details. You had timings of erections, you had whether or not there was an orgasm, you had every little detail of their intimate encounter played out. Ireland and Ulster rugby player Paddy Jackson has told Belfast Crown Court that he did not rape a woman at his house in Belfast two years ago. The 26-year-old was questioned for three hours in the witness box today. Shortly after 10.30, he took the stand and the 11-member jury heard his account of events. He said the sexual activity with the complainant was consensual. Paddy Jackson's appearance in the witness stand was keenly anticipated. He was initially taken through his life to date, including his career, his 25 caps for Ireland, how he moved from England to Belfast with his family, um, his playing days in, in school and even his hobbies. Uh, drawing and um, making YouTube videos. Then we got to the events of that night. He said the sexual activity with the complainant was consensual. He said he was unaware she was upset when leaving his home. The last thing I would want is a girl crying and leaving my house. I would have completely freaked out. I would have gone to help her. The prosecution barrister asked him about the conversation he and his three friends from the house had when they met the following day. It wasn't discussed, the fact that she had been in hysterics and it wasn't going to end well. No, they didn't say it to me, Paddy Jackson replied. The Jake Home group was a WhatsApp group between the, the accused men and a number of others who weren't named in the trial, who weren't involved. Um, it was made up of their initials. And that was where I think the term spit roasting first emerged. Um, I think pump to bird was, was, was one of the terms used. Um, and that was also, of course, the, the arena in which the girls were described as sluts and Belfast sluts. So the kind of language that was being used in that WhatsApp group, which was a private group between, I think, whatever, six guys, um, I think that shocked people. 
Around noon on the 28th of June, McElroy texted Harrison and he asked what the fuck was going on, followed by last night was hilarious. The reply from Harrison was not recovered, so we don't know what that was. But we do know that McElroy's next message was, really, fuck's sake, did you calm her? Followed by, where did she live? Now Harrison then replied immediately and he said, mate, no jokes, she was in hysterics. Wasn't going to end well. What struck me about the defendants was an absence of shame. Yes, they were embarrassed, they were mortified, their families were in the public gallery. But there was a kind of a shrugging, bewildered, this is how we roll. Blaine McElroy sent a message uh, to someone not before the court um, saying, pumped the girl with Jacko on Monday, roasted her, then another on Tuesday. For the prosecution, these messages were an indication of the men's total disrespect for women. Uh, now, the defence argued that these were just examples of banter between lads at a private message group, and they were just trying to one-up each other and impress each other, and there was nothing more sinister than that. Ulster and Ireland rugby player Stuart Olding arriving to take the stand at Laganside Court this morning. From the witness box, he recalled a party in Paddy Jackson's house and told of going upstairs, intending to sleep in Paddy Jackson's room. He said he found Paddy Jackson there lying on the bed with the complainant on top of him and they were kissing. He said that the woman put out her hand as if to invite him into the room. He went into the room, she performed oral sex on him. When that was over, he left the room and went to sleep elsewhere. That was his evidence. The trial heard evidence from Dara Florence, one of three other women who went to an after party in Paddy Jackson's house on the night in question. Dara Florence was probably one of the most important witnesses in the trial, and she was a mixed bag for both the prosecution and the defence. She said that when she was ready to go home, she went looking for her friend and opened a bedroom door in the house and told the court she saw what she described as a threesome. She said that Jackson turned to her and asked her did she want to join in, and she replied no and shut the door. She said there was nothing to indicate a lack of consent. However, under cross-examination from the prosecution counsel, she also said there was nothing to indicate positive consent either. Rory Harrison was the last of the accused to give evidence. Now, he wasn't accused of any sexual offending whatsoever. Uh, he was accused of trying to cover up the alleged rape and of uh, destroying evidence. Harrison accepted that the woman had texted him the next day with the words, what happened last night was not consensual. And he also said that he had lunch with Paddy Jackson and the two other accused shortly after that. Um, but he said he never told Jackson about the text. Now, the trial had also heard about uh, messages from Harrison to the woman uh, saying things like, uh, keep the chin up, uh, you beautiful young lady. Uh, Harrison said he was trying to, to comfort the woman because she was so upset. But then, when he had left her, he was sending messages in which he claimed he had just thrown her home. And he was talking to his friends in a completely different way. And he was describing last night as having been hilarious and more flutes than the 12th of July. We heard that after the, the morning after, one of them sent the others a, a, a gif, I think, or a, a little video of, of a, a spit roast. They were talking about being top shaggers and they were exchanging things about very loose, whatever that meant. It's not entirely clear what that meant, but it, you know, it's not, you know, the lines of speculation that you can follow are not attractive in any way. There were photographs taken at the party, uh, which presumably the young woman who took part in the photographs just thought were fun. These were captioned, uh, love Belfast sluts and, you know, uh, they used terms like brassers and uh, there were exchanges about um, any sluts get fucked. To talk about women like that, to view women like that, they've all got sisters as far as I know, mothers, female friends. And yet to them, these women, the Belfast sluts as they were referred to, were a collection of orifices and they were were deserving of no more regard than if they were a urinal. You gathered around, you unzipped, you zipped up and you had a chat with your pals, made eye contact with them while you were there, and then went on your way. 
The judge began giving her charge to the jury last Friday. She continued it today. And if, as expected, she concludes tomorrow, then the way will be clear for the 11 members of the jury to begin their deliberations. It was supposed to be a five-week trial. So when the jury were finally sent out after nine weeks of evidence, everyone kind of settled in for the long haul. Everyone, I think, assumed that we'd be there for at least a few days as the jury sifted through the evidence. When the jury went out, I just think there was, there was just mass relief that because it had gone on for so long. And I think a lot of people were wondering, the big question then was how long were they going to take? Then on the Wednesday, word went around that the jury had reached a verdict and everyone rushed back into court. Um, in fact, there were so many people trying to get into court that as soon as it was, it was full, the court usher actually locked the doors. The jury in this trial had been deliberating for over three hours. At that stage, the judge, Patricia Smith, made it known that the jury had reached a unanimous decision on all six counts. The defendants were then told by the foreman of the jury that the verdict on all counts involving all the defendants was not guilty. Paddy Jackson, Stuart Olding, Blaine McElroy and Rory Harrison then emerged from the court. Many of them were weeping. They hugged their families. They're outside courtroom number 12 at the moment and shortly we're expecting them to come to the microphones and the large contingent of reporters gathered outside Laganside Court where they're expected to give their reaction to this trial. Just step back, guys. I was extremely surprised that um, after a case which lasted nine weeks and with six separate charges and four separate defendants, the jury reached their verdict, their unanimous verdict, within three and three quarter hours. I have to say it didn't surprise me that it was a relatively quick verdict. It was a net issue. It was a net question. Was there consent or was there not? Do you believe beyond a reasonable doubt that these young men intended to rape this woman? knew at the time that she was objecting and carried on regardless. You couldn't but have seen them in the witness box without thinking, you know, whatever breakdown of communications happened, they did not believe they were doing anything wrong. Uh, yeah, I'd just like to thank uh, the judge and the jury for giving me a fair trial. Uh, my parents for being here every day, uh, as well as my brother and sisters. Out of respect for my employers, I have nothing further to comment. Uh, both Jackson and Olding opted to have their lawyers uh, get, read their statements. Joe McVeigh read a statement which was, I think you could char characterise it as being quite belligerent. He again um, took issue with some of the complainant's evidence. He took issue with what was happening in social media. He took issue with the Crown Prosecution Service even taking the case in the first place. Consistency had never been a feature of the complainant's evidence long before she entered the witness box. So these acquittals should come as no surprise. He then moved on to talk about the social media coverage, which he described as having been vile. Vile commentary expressed on social media, going well beyond fair comment, has polluted the sphere of public discourse and raised real concerns about the integrity of the trial process. And that, I think, was quite incendiary, given that most people had felt really shocked by the social media exchanges which we had heard, uh, which had been shared by these guys and their friends. Unbeknownst to us, we were in a room with no windows. We didn't know that, that Paddy Jackson and his team had already gone out and, and, and had, had, had made their statement. We took Stuart into uh, one of the consultation rooms. We then set about, um, set about getting uh, our... Um, our, our thoughts down on paper, uh, and uh, he contributed uh, to that, you know, from start through to finish. As I said at the time, uh, what I read out was actually written by him. It was, a, it was his, in his handwriting. I want to acknowledge publicly that though I committed no criminal offence on the evening of the 28th of June 2016, I regret deeply the events of that evening. I want to acknowledge that the complainant came to court and gave evidence about her perception of those events. I am sorry for the hurt that was caused to the complainant. It was never my intention to cause any upset to anyone on that night. I don't agree with her perception of events 
and I maintain that everything that happened that evening was consensual. Some people would be cynical about what he said, but I think it struck something of a gracious note in, you know, after a period when we'd been hearing stuff that was anything but gracious. And I think most people felt that it was an appropriate note to have struck compared with the note struck by Paddy Jackson's statement. Once the verdict came in, things weren't over by a long shot. Paddy Jackson's lawyer had said that he was going to sue anybody who had um, claimed that his client was a rapist. Obviously this piqued the ire and the anger again of people who were already f had a lot of feelings around the trial. This hashtag came up, sue me Paddy, and thousands and thousands of people were putting up these messages on social media saying, um, I've got 103 uh, euros uh, to the negative in my account, sue me, Paddy. I still believe her. Uh, I've got um, five pounds, you know, sue me, Paddy. You know, you know, sort of taunting uh, Paddy Jackson and saying, you know, do your worst. I still believe this young woman and what she said. Public reaction, the level of it, I just did not expect at all. I knew there'd be some kickback, but then it was just like hell was unleashed. There have been demonstrations in Dublin and other cities in support of survivors of sexual violence. Speakers have called for changes in the way in which complainants in rape trials are treated. Outside the Kingspan Stadium, about 300 people, mainly women from feminist groups and, and women's rights movement, who were really just there to make a point um, that you know the, the end of the trial didn't mean uh, the end of, of the movement um, for, for better treatment of women. The aftermath of the trial then, you know, took it into a completely different level. Um, you know, the trial finished uh, in the week before Easter, and you know that Easter weekend, I, I did nothing other than read social media because then the I believe her and the Me Too hashtag was, was, was gaining uh, a lot of prominence. And some of the things that were being posted on, on, on social media certainly was, was, was disturbing from a, from a fairness perspective or from a, a, you know, even issues that traversed the, the laws of, of, of libel and defamation. So there was just a, it was just an avalanche of, of reaction that certainly in my almost 20 years of, of, of private practice, I had never experienced. It was becoming very obvious that sponsors were getting a bit shaky about what would happen if Paddy Jackson or Stuart Olding took to the field again in an Ulster or an Irish jersey. Sponsors have enormous power. These people want to be associated with rugby and uh, they want to be seen in a better light with their association with rugby. And once something uh, of this nature comes along, they absolutely wants to distance himself. Paddy Jackson obviously had time to reflect and nine days later he put out a response which actually was quite similar to what Stuart Olding had said initially. In a statement issued to the Press Association, Mr Jackson said, I am ashamed that a young woman who was a visitor to my home left in a distressed state. This was never my intention and I will always regret the events of that evening. I think people questioned the sincerity of it given that we were also getting reports that Bank of Ireland had been on to Ulster and the IRFU kind of wondering well our names are on your shirts guys what's going to happen here once it became obvious that they were worried I think the IRFU's decision on it um, was becoming more and more clear the IRFU and Ulster Rugby have now decided to end the contracts of Paddy Jackson and Stuart Olding with immediate effect the rugby authority said that decision to sack the players acknowledged their commitment to the core values of the game, respect, inclusivity and integrity. As part of that commitment, the IRFU said it had also agreed to carry out an in-depth review of existing structures and educational programmes within the game in Ireland to ensure those core values are practised at every level of the game. Paddy Jackson, in a statement, said he was deeply disappointed by the outcome of the IRFU review, but he said he recognised that his behaviour had fallen far short of the values expected of him. I think lives have been ruined. For Jackson, I think he is the most unlucky and he has lost the most. He had a, he had a seven or eight year international career ahead of him. That's gone. He'll now, I don't think he'll ever play for Ireland again. I think that even if they had been found guilty, a lot of people would have felt 
wow, if that's what you have to go through to take a rape case, would I be willing to do that? Would I recommend my friend or my daughter or my sister or my mother to make a complaint of rape given that that's the, the procedure that is followed? Justice was done. I think only now we're actually starting to hear uh, another voice on this. If there's any silver lining to this, I mean, I'm sure it's no comfort to the people that were involved, is that the fallout from this trial has opened up public conversations that hadn't been had before. I don't think we've learned a thing from it. And I think if you look, you know, as proof of that, of the way that this, this particular type of behaviour has almost been ring-fenced around these guys, that WhatsApp group, those men, those players who now cannot be allowed to play on this hallowed soil again. They're out of the country, they're gone, we're never going to have to deal with them again. We haven't answered the questions, we haven't even begun to, to ask ourselves what exactly this revealed about our kids and about the generation that we're rearing.